Welcome back to AP Chemistry and General Chemistry. I'm Jeremy Krug, and in this video, we're going to be continuing our discussion from last time. So in the last video, we were learning about gravimetric analysis. In this video, we we're learning about more indirect analysis methods in chemistry, specifically spectrophotometry. Now, we know that there are other indirect uh, chemical analysis methods. Uh, one of those is acid-based titration. We take advantage of... Uh, uh, color in this particular type of reaction. We'll talk more about acid-base titrations in a future lesson toward the end of this course. In this video, though, we're looking at spectroscopy, or more specifically, spectrophotometry. This is where we're using color intensity to determine the concentration of a solution. So you perhaps you, you've done that before in your own uh, personal uh, life or your own application. Maybe you've had some iced tea before. And you know that based upon the color or the intensity of the color of that iced tea, you can tell how concentrated it is. You know, this iced tea over here on the right is really, really strong. Whereas you can water it down, and here on the left, it looks like you hardly have any tea at all. So this is essentially, in a very simplified version, of what we're doing in spectrophotometry. Now, we use an instrument that analyzes the intensity of the color in a solution. Then we're going to take that information to find out how concentrated that solution is in moles per liter. Now, this instrument is called a spectrophotometer. And I've, I've mentioned this word a couple of times. It's kind of a long word. Basically, we're using color and light. That's, that's what the photo is. And the spectro, we're talking about the specific color of the light, the, where it falls along the electromagnetic spectrum, and we're measuring that. That's what the meter is. So spectrophotometer, we are measuring the color of light. That's basically all it is. Now, the way this works, there has to be a light source inside that spectrophotometer. So this could be some sort of a light bulb. It's usually a very special light bulb. It's not one of these you know, normal uh, yellow light bulbs. But it's going to be some sort of a light source. And we know that these light sources give off uh, colors, give off uh, wavelengths in several uh, different wavelengths, several different colors, almost all the colors of the visible spectrum. If you've ever seen a white light, that's pretty much what it gives off. So that white light is going to be uh, focused into a color filter. So I've just chosen red for this one. And so I have a red filter, and that's going to filter out the red light. So only the red light is going to be able to proceed through that color filter. And so this is where that red light, in this case, is going to hit the solution sample. Now that solution sample is in a little glass prism, uh, basically a little rectangular glass prism thing. It's called a cuvette. And that's where the sample is being held. And so the light is passing through that cuvette that has the solution in it. And some of it, excuse me, some of it is being uh, passed through. Some of it is being absorbed. And so we're going to be measuring how much of that light is able to pass through. So as you can see, not all of the light passed through that solution sample. Well, on the other end, we're actually able to take a light detector and measure how much light was able to pass through. Now, that's what a spectrophotometer does. This is a very, uh, certainly an oversimplified uh, discussion of what it does, but that's basically what's happening in there. That's a spectrophotometer. Now, this is what the thing actually looks like. The little slot here, there's, there's a little door here, and you will slide the cuvette in there that has the solution in it. And there's a dial here where you're able to adjust the wavelength. You can change the color that's being allowed to pass through. And then the light detector is in there, and it's attached to this electronic readout. So there's an actual readout there. In this case, it's a digital readout that tells us the absorbance. Uh, some of the more old-fashioned spectrophotometers don't have a digital readout. They have an actual dial, an analog dial. It has a needle on it, and it points to, to the number uh, showing the uh, absorbance. But that's what the spectrophotometer looks like. Now, as we analyze some of these things, there are some concepts that, that we want to think about as we're analyzing these solutions. You know, there are several solutions that we work with that have 
multiple substances in them. And every one of those substances, every one of those elements or ions that we're trying to analyze may absorb light over a range of different wavelengths. Now, this graph that I have here shows an example of what could happen if you're not very choosy, very specific about how you choose the wavelength at which you carry out this analysis. Let's just say that we have a mixture of cobalt ions and copper ions, cobalt two ions and copper two ions to be uh, more specific here. Well, as you can see, cobalt has a maximum absorbance somewhere around 500 nanometers, right? On the other hand, copper two ions have a maximum absorbance somewhere a little bit over 800 nanometers. So that's going to affect where you set your spectral photometer. Now, let's say that it's our job to determine the concentration of the cobalt two ions. To what frequency would you want to set the spectral photometer? Well, like we just said, you'd want to set it to 500 nanometers. Now, what if you want to measure the amount of copper two ions in this solution? Would you still use 500? No, you'd want to use something that's closer to 800, or perhaps a little higher than that, right? If you don't use the right um, wavelength or the right uh, uh, yeah, you have to write the wavelength here, you're going to end up measuring the wrong thing. Let's say that, for example, just on accident, instead of hitting it to 500, you accidentally set it to 600. What's the problem if you get it at 600? Well, you're measuring not just the cobalt, you're measuring the copper, and you really don't know from which, uh, fr from which of those ions your absorbance is coming from. So what you want to do is always shoot for the highest, the maximum absorbance that also has the least amount of interference. And so notice, if even if you got over here to 550, you know, right at this point, if you're trying to measure the, the, the uh, cobalt ions, you'll, you'll be able to measure a lot of them, but you're going to have a significant amount of interference at 550 from the copper. And so that's why you want to go for the maximum absorbance that has the least interference, you know, negligible interference in this case, from the other substances. So that's what you're shooting for when you're choosing the actual wavelength that you're uh, performing your experiment at. Well, after we've done all that, how do we use this method to actually determine the concentration of a solution? Well, let's try an example. Let's imagine that we're in the laboratory and we have to do this. Well, there is an actual equation for this. It's called Beer's Law, sometimes called Beer-Lambert Law. It's the same thing, though. Uh, Beer's Law basically looks like this. A equals ABC. Now, sometimes this can be a little bit confusing because we have two A's in here, but this is how the equation is written on the AP exam, so that's how I'm putting it here. The big A, the capital A, is the absorbance. Now that's the number that's actually going to be given to you on the spectral photometer. That's the digital readout or sometimes an analog readout with the needle pointing to it. Uh, absorbance should always be a number between 0 and 1. It's going to be some kind of a decimal number between 0 and 1. If your absorbance is less than 0 or greater than 1, you've done something wrong and you need to recalibrate uh, your experiment. Okay, so that's the number that we're getting off of the spectral photometer. Now, this, this little a, this lowercase a, is a constant. This is called the molar absorptivity. And the molar absorptivity is a constant that measures how well the substance absorbs light. And since it's a constant, it's probably going to have some funny units. The units for molar absorptivity usually are going to be reciprocal molarity, reciprocal centimeters. Okay, so sometimes this will be a very large number, sometimes a not so large number, but those will usually be the units that you have for that. Now, the value for B. The B is the path length through which the light is passing through the sample, and that's in centimeters. Now, that's the width of the, the width of the cuvette, excuse me. Now, almost always, it's going to be one centimeter. And that's because when you purchase these cuvettes from the, the company that makes them, 
they're probably always going to be one centimeter. Now, it's possible you could go out there and find some two centimeter cuvettes or some other ones, but, you know, they're pretty much always going to be one centimeter. One of the reasons we do that is that your spectrophotometer has a little slot in it where the cuvette has to fit. And you know what? Those, those little slots are normally made to fit one centimeter cuvette. So if you go, you know, try to buy cuvettes that are too big or too small, it might not work right. Okay, so that's why we almost always use one centimeter because that's just the size that the cuvettes are that you end up purchasing most of the time. Now, C, that makes a little bit more sense as far as C. C stands for concentration, and that makes sense, right? It's in moles per liter. So if you take the concentration, and you take the, the path length in centimeters, and you multiply those by the molar absorptivity, you should get the absorbance that is given to you on the uh, spectrophotometer readout. Now, Let's simplify this a little bit because this can be pretty complex. When we start talking about constants and path length and all that, we can simplify this down a little bit for our purposes, especially in, uh, in, in, in AP chemistry. Uh, the molar absorptivity, the lowercase a here, for a substance at a specific wavelength is not going to change. It should be a constant value. And we've just got done saying that the path length, that cuvette size, which is B here, should not change. Almost always, we can be you know, pretty sure that B is going to be one centimeter. So that shouldn't change. So what does that leave with? Uh, what does that leave us with? It leaves us with absorbance, capital A, and concentration, C. It's just telling us that all that's left is absorbance is directly proportional to concentration. And if that's what we have, then we could graph them and it should be a straight line. If you grab if you graph absorbance on one axis and concentration on the other axis. So let's try that. So let's say that we have a lab, an experiment, and we're actually going to find the concentration of cobalt 2 ions in moles per liter. And we're going to use that using a spectrophotometer, or do that using a spectrophotometer. And we have absorbance on the y-axis. So the very first thing you want to do is prepare a blank. And so the blank is going to have zero of whatever it is you're trying to find. So my recommendation is use, just use some distilled water in a clean cuvette. And if you have that, absorbance at zero molar should be zero. So that's why I've plotted a point right there, zero absorbance at zero moles per liter. Well, the next thing that you want to do is prepare a few other solutions of known concentration of whatever it is you're trying to find. And you plot those absorbances. So maybe you find that you know, at 0 0.02 molar, we get an absorbance of 0.10. And then we try it again at 0 0.06 molar, and it's about 0.3 five, somewhere in that neighborhood. And then we try a dot at uh, 0.1 molar, and we have, oh, look at this, about 0.55. And we have those on the graph. Now, and as you can see, it looks like they're forming a fairly straight line. Now, they won't always make a line that's quite that pretty. Sometimes you'll have to uh, estimate the best fit line, and you'll have to draw that. And so uh, we can draw it pretty much a straight line in this case. And once we have the best fit line, well, now we can determine the absorbance of a solution with unknown concentration. So, for example, if we have an unknown concentration of cobalt 2 ion, and we plug it into the, the little slot there, and it shows an absorbance of, let's say it's about, right here, about 0.27, somewhere in there. Well, we just take that over to the line, and we can see, as we drag that down, it looks like the concentration right there is going to be 0.04, I'm sorry, 0 0.05 uh, moles per liter or somewhere very close to that. So hopefully by taking a look at this video, you have seen how we do spectrophotometry, how it works and how you can uh, calculate the concentration of a solution with absorbance. I hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you learned something from this video. If you did, please smash that 
thumbs up button, please. That'd give me a like if you would be so kind as to do so. I'm Jeremy Krug. I've been teaching AP Chemistry for over 20 years, and I want to make sure that you get a 5 on this test, that you make an A in the class. And so subscribe if you haven't done so already, and join me again where we'll talk about some more uh, spectrophotometry examples. We'll work some more uh, examples in, in this next video and see what could possibly go wrong and some possible errors and, and how to solve those. So thanks again for watching and join me again where we can learn some more chemistry together.